This FedGov Today program is sponsored by Red Spin and W2 Communications. On this edition of FedGov Today with Francis Rose, the DIA's Big Five for 2024, a stepping stone to cyber solutions at the Pentagon and pushing $700 billion in savings even higher. Welcome to FedGov Today with Francis Rose. The Defense Intelligence Agency's Joint Worldwide Intelligence Communication System is at the top of the agency's modernization list, but it's only one of DIA's top five items for 2024. E.P. Matthew is Deputy Chief Information Officer at DIA. E.P., welcome. It's great to see you again, talk to you again. You were on the FedGov Today podcast a couple of months back talking about the JWIX modernization. What is that system? What do you do with it? And how are you modernizing it? So thank you, and, and thank you for having me over here. Uh, so it's following up on your question on JWIX, I think the first thing is focusing on redundancy and resiliency, right? Um, what we've seen foreign adversaries do is, you know, the ability to disrupt communications. JVIX for us is our internet on the TSSCI side. And so our first goal is to do that. And we've been doing that for the last couple of years. Well, what are we going to do in the future in terms of modernization? Looking in terms of creating a brand new architecture. Our current architecture is about 30 years old. Mm. Will not meet the challenges of, of tomorrow, right? We know the PRC is going to celebrate 100 years in uh, in 2027, but well, we don't know what the implications of the, that are, right? So how do you build an architecture at the TSSEI side that can meet all the requirements? We see what Russia did with Ukraine. The first thing they did is cut out the internet. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have command and control, you cannot, you know, you cannot uh, uh, defend uh, the homeland or defend our, our allies that are that need us. So that's our goal: is to modernize and put in a brand new architecture um, that has been. 30 years out of date. You used an interesting term there, challenges of tomorrow. And I wonder what those look like or what they align with maybe other policy documents inside the, uh, de the Defense Department uh, and, and things like that. Like, how, what is it, what are those challenges of tomorrow in general or as specific as you can be um, that you're working toward? So I think the biggest challenge is if you know a foreign adversary is going to disrupt your command and control, how do you, how do you develop solutions around that? Right, so I think what has changed for us that didn't exist uh, before is um, uh, what Elon Musk did with the ability to, you know, reuse rockets. Mm -hmm. So using uh, space shuttle um, Atl Atlantis as an example, in 25 years they did about 32 missions. Elon Musk is able to do 150 missions a year, and think of the ability to use resiliency and redundancy, not only in space but in other areas, right? Um, I can't go more specific than that of because of, of because of security classifications. Understood. But it, but it gives us, again, uh, tremendous flexibility. JWIX is priority one in the priorities that you and Doug Casa, the agency CIO, have set out for this year. Give me an overview of the other four, the things that you're working for that are your big markers for this year. Yeah, I think the next one would be DOTUS modernization, right? So uh, that is our internal LAN. So it doesn't matter if the wide area network is great, the user experience is based on how good the LAN is, right? Not just the local area network, but from the desktops onwards. So what does the future of the future desktop look like? Right? How do we le leverage cloud computing? How do we leverage collaboration tools? How do we uh, leverage AI to solve those things, right? So one of the things that we are starting to do is 40% of our internal ticketing system is done by an AI chatbot. Most people don't know that, right? How do I deliver better customer service? Because if, you, if I can come in, access my desktop, access the applications that I need to, you can solve, you know, most people are satisfied with that and you can solve the issues that we need to solve with those kinds of things, right? So the DOTUS modernization is our next one. I imagine the fact that most people don't know it's an AI chatbot is a big win, right? The, Absolutely. The idea that they can get what they need and move on without that intervention of a human and those humans then can pay attention to the things that they really need to pay attention Absolutely. to. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, again, uh, interesting phrase there, future desktop. Is that a rhetorical question? What does the future desktop look like? Or is that a question that you know the answer to and are already working toward? So I think we're where we want to be is leveraging 
our industry partners, right, in terms of what capabilities exist. What we don't want to do is customize something that is so unique to us that the legacy tail or the O&M tail or the maintenance tail becomes so expensive. Mm -hmm. So what are the future capabilities that are applicable to us, but not only us, but to our our 5i partners, our foreign partners, our NATO partners, our non-traditional partners, right? It's ultimately the ability to share data is what makes intelligence valuable. And if you can't share data, mm -hmm. right, um, your intelligence is really limited in its capability and you could be potentially writing the first edition of a history book. Yeah, how does that proliferation of data inform the way that you take on all these modernization tasks? It strikes me that the intelligence community in particular is in an interesting place because you're using now a lot of open source information that's coming from outside the department, from commercial partners, from academia, and so on, and you're combining all of that with proprietary stuff that you have. What does that mean for what you and your colleagues need to do infrastructure-wise? Right, so one, adopting and moving to infrastructure as a service. And you said it, right? Previously, we used to customize a lot and build um, and have proprietary information. It's to move away from proprietary information. So even in cloud, we have, we have multiple clouds that's available to us at the TSSCI side. What we don't want to do is adopt native cloud services that are unique to a cloud vendor, because then data interoperability becomes a challenge. Right, and so I don't want to adopt something that's unique to one cloud because if I send something to a foreign partner, that cloud provider may not exist in that country, right? And then the ability to send that data or for that foreign partner to access that data at the speed of mission mm -hmm. becomes a challenge. This might be more of a philosophical question than a tactical question, but I've, I've heard the, dis the discussion around architecture probably more in the last six months or year than I did in the five years before that. What's the reason for that? I imagine part of what you just, part of the reason is what you just described, but is there more to it than that? Yeah, so, you know, when Amazon first started AWS, uh, what Jeff, Be Jeff Bezos said is that, you know, he had a unique advantage, market advantage, and that is there was no other competition, right, in AWS. Amazon was the only cloud provider in AWS for about seven years. The same thing has happened internal in the, at the TS level. There was only Amazon as a cloud provider for the last 10 years. What, what we've seen now is that now we will have access to multiple cloud providers, right? So Amazon, Microsoft, Oracle, uh, Google, and then eventually IBM. Mm -hmm. So now I need to consider interoperability. Um, between multiple cloud providers. I need to fa factor in uh, what, what is best of breed in what particular system, right? And how do I do that? Um, and if I can't, for a user, a user doesn't care what cloud provider you use. They just want access to the data. So I now have to think about architecture and inter interop interoperability. Same idea as that AI chatbot. The user Absolutely. doesn't care. They right. just want the answer that they want, Absolutely. the solution that they want. As long as it works, doesn't matter. That's right. How does that inform the way that you go about building these? That, that that's the ultimate goal is that delivery to your customer, in this case, an internal customer and employee. Yeah, so I think that goes in terms of design, right? Like a uh, lot harder for us to think about this after a solution has been implemented. The cost of doing what we call a production level error is exponentially exponentially expensive than identifying it at a manufacturing error, right? So at the design, if you do find something at the design or requirement phase, very easy to fix, very easy to solve. Anything done post-production, meaning post-deployment, exponentially expensive. Um, we have, uh, we'll put a link to the other, to all five of the of your top five priorities in the show page today at fedgovtoday.com, because um, we're not going to have time to get to them all. But it strikes me that in these modernization efforts that you're undertaking, that's a common theme in all of the work that you're doing. Have you had an opportunity to rethink some of the business processes that you're modernizing absolutely. instead of just digitizing what you've already been doing? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that and I didn't get to it is that the third one is you know building like um, what we call our capable delivery pipeline, which is what, in simple terms, our, our DIA app store, right? So once you have an app store or platform as a service, you have the ability to digitize and modernize your entire end-to-end back-end business process. You cannot go and leverage AI tools if you have a legacy, legacy um, application or legacy data process, right? Can be done. It can be done. So one of the things that we have done is we have, in the last one year or so, we have modernized over 300 um, business processes. 
again, digitize them completely, and we have seen the benefits of those things. And one of those benefits is, is this you know, AI chatbot, what we've seen multiple, where again, about 300 or so business backend processes, end to end, where a user can now leverage the capabilities that they have at home, right, and, and have that inside the government. EP, it's great to have you on the program. Thanks very much for joining me today. I appreciate your time. Thank you. You can read more about DIA's priorities on today's show page, as I mentioned, at FedGovToday.com. Up next, a stepping stone to cyber solutions at the Pentagon. FedGov Today with Francis Rose continues in a moment. Here's Louis Bergeron, Senior Vice President for Navy at Covini on innovation in government from Sea Air Space, presented by Kerasoft. So if I can tell you uh, all the different parts that this manufacturer makes and all the different systems that those parts go on across the entire Navy enterprise, I can start thinking about demand in a, in a new and innovative way where I can aggregate demand across multiple different systems and multiple different programs. It's that application of data at scale which a lot, of, um, uh, a lot of times is tough to do in the government context because the way that we structure our program offices and the PEOs, the program executive offices, and the systems commands as a, as a whole. And so what we try to do is break down those, uh, those data silos to allow uh, our customers to be able to see the whole breadth of the demand and the supply side. For more, go to innovationingov.com. Welcome back. The Defense Department's Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification will require vendors that sell to DOD to pass assessments of their cyber readiness. The department's created a stepping stone to those requirements as it figures out what those assessments should include. Dave Bailey is Vice President of Security Services at Redspin. Dave, welcome. Thanks for coming on the show. What, does, what is the Joint Surveillance Voluntary Assessment and what does it assess? Well, thanks for having me. And the Joint Surveillance Program is an opportunity for a Department of Defense uh, company to get certified under CMMC prior to the rulemaking that's uh, supposed to happen later this year. It, it is a assessment that will uh, ensure the Department of Defense that they have certain cybersecurity practices in place and that they can protect sensitive information. And that stepping stone or, or kind of link to what the final CMC, uh, CMMC requirements become is uh, what industry is trying to learn more about. What have you seen trend-wise as far as companies that are going through the process and what they've encountered, uh, what you've seen as far as uh, trying to get these companies to the end, uh, or at least the end of this part of it? The companies that have participated in the Joint Surveillance Program overall, it's been an extremely positive experience. It, it provides for them a mechanism to go through the process now. Uh, there's also a, a little bit different in the rigor that will take place once the law goes into effect. The Joint Surveillance Program does allow uh, for a company with minor findings outside of the assessment to be able to uh, fix those findings over about a 180 day period in order, um, in, in order to demonstrate that they have those practices in place. Once the rule making goes into effect, uh, those requirements will become a little, a little harder to, mm -hmm. uh, to maintain. I was at the ACT IAC conference a couple of weeks ago and some of the leaders of companies there were talking about this process and said, well, I'm a little, I'm hesitant because if I go through it now, am I gonna have to go through it again when the final rule comes out and so on? What's the, what does that mean for companies that wanna to sell to DOD? No, it, the Joint Surveillance Program is the CMMC process. Uh, they will honor it once the law goes into effect. So really it's an opportunity for a company now to get ready, get prepared and, and also to, uh, to achieve that certification prior to the rulemaking. Because once the rulemaking goes into effect, there's many thousands of companies that will all be vying for those certifications. When a company comes to this process, what makes a company well prepared for the JSVA? And what makes a company maybe not quite ready for prime time to go through the process? Now, a company that has to go through this process must demonstrate that they're able to have the practices in place to protect sensitive information. So to be able to identify that security enclave, that area where you're gonna protect uh, that uh, uh, 
unclassified information, uh, they have to be able to you know, show the assessors and, and show a company like Redspin uh, that they can implement the things that are, that are appropriate for that data protection. What's the long tail look like? What do you see for this process six months out, a year out, two years out, and when we get past the official uh, beginning of the CMC, CMMC, I always miss that, one of those M's, uh, the CMMC certification process. What does that look like for the companies that are in the program and for the companies that are going through the program to get certified? The overall CMMC certification is is not just a one-time or, or single single action that a company has to take. It's a, it is a process that is a long journey and and will over time they you know they have to continue to demonstrate that they have those practices in place and and we see you know uh, this particular process to to continue to mature as uh, as we look towards you know potentially other countries other agencies as well that will you know participate in a program that ultimately says that you have to demonstrate those requirements to an assessor. And that will give me plenty of time to make sure I get both M's when I try to say CMMC from exactly, now on. Exactly, exactly. Thanks very much for joining me, Dave. I appreciate it. Thank you very time. much for having me. You can read more about CMMC on today's show page at FedGovToday.com. Up next, pushing $700 billion in savings even higher. FedGov Today with Francis Rose continues in a moment. Don't miss the latest episode of Innovation in Government. You'll get exclusive insights from the Artificial Intelligence for Government Summit presented by Kerasoft. Discover how AI's revolutionizing government operations. You'll meet leaders from the Department of Homeland Security, the Labor Department, and the Commerce Department telling you what they're doing now and what's coming next for AI in government. Innovation in Government, on demand now at innovationingov.com. Welcome back. 112 new instances of overlap, duplication, and fragmentation could save the federal government billions of dollars, according to the Government Accountability Office. GAO's count of financial benefits to the government through its past work on overlap, duplication, and fragmentation is about $670 billion and rising. Jessica Lucas-Judy is Director of Strategic Issues at GAO. Jessica, welcome. Thanks for joining me. Give me a thumbnail quickly to begin of what each of those terms means, overlap, duplication, fragmentation. Sure. So fragmentation is where you have multiple federal agencies that are working in similar areas, trying to do similar kinds of things. Overlap is where, just like it sounds like, you know, maybe there's some crossover, uh, might be serving the same kind of beneficiaries. And then duplication, again, exactly what it sounds like. They're doing the same thing for the same people. Now, one thing I do want to note is that just the presence of fragmentation, overlap, or duplication by itself is not necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes you need redundancy or they're big problems, and it takes a lot of different agencies working together to be able to address them and you might still end up with, with areas of need. But what we're looking for is ways for the government to better manage those um, to make it more effective and more efficient. I mentioned the 112 new instances, and uh, my takeaway from reading your work and your team's work is that some of the old instances still exist. Are right. there common themes in what you see in this, in this bulk of work in any of those three areas? Sure, yeah. So some of the new recommendations that we make um, are where agencies actually are working together already. Um, they're collaborating and trying to, to make the services more effective or more efficient, but they're not necessarily, um, they haven't necessarily defined common outcomes to make sure they're working towards the same goals. Um, they haven't fully defined the, the roles and responsibilities of the different agencies, um, and they could better track the, the results and share information. In the instances in the past where you have found examples examples of any of those three things and those instances have been resolved those recommendations that you made were carried out and and implemented or for any other reason what are some of the common threads of the success that you've seen in organizations that have been able to ameliorate these problems in the past? A really good communication and really effective. Sometimes it's a national strategy that's needed or a, a written agreement. Documentation is really important. You know, we're 
government accountability office we like to make sure that that folks are being accountable um, but so sometimes what you have is agencies working together um, at the moment they're working together just fine but you want to make sure that's written down so that all the parties understand what they're supposed to do so that if there's turnover or if things change there's some kind of, of continuity there so we have a number of, of recommendations in this year's report highlighting uh, research and agencies being able to share information about things like wildlife diseases um, or uh, their efforts to um, to combat child trafficking, you know, some very, very serious issues, but they need to work together better to be able to communicate what those results are. I imagine the answer to this question might be it depends, but are most of these easy to solve or are most of them difficult to solve, Jessica? It depends. Oh, Good sorry. answer. I just couldn't help it. No, <laughs> <Don't blame> it, <laughs> um, some of these are really big, really big areas, and really, and th those tend to be the recurring problems that we see year after year. You know, we've tracked now more than 2,000 recommendations, and I'm happy to say that uh, that about two thirds of them have been fully addressed, and others have been partially addressed. And through those that work, uh, we've been able to track about 667 billion dollars in financial benefits, uh, but there is still more. Than that needs to be done. I mentioned the uh, the financial benefits at the beginning of our conversation. What do you do, and I may also mentioned you do this on an ongoing basis. Right. What do you do to follow on with the ones that are already, that you've already looked at to see where they stand each year? We do, uh, in addition to this kind of report, we also do our annual report on, or uh, every two years on the high risk, mm -hmm. you know, programs that are high risk across the federal government, as well as communicate uh, letters to the heads of agencies about the, the uh, recommendations that we have that are the highest priority for attention, and also working, uh, working with the Congress to make sure that, that they know, um, because a lot of the ones that have the potential for the biggest savings require some kind of congressional action, and you'll see there's a number of them in this year's report uh, related to um, changes in, in Medicare, changes in, in taxes and things like that um, to be able to save the government big money. What is the intersection with this work and the high risk list work? Because as you said, not every instance of overlap, duplication, fragmentation is a bad thing necessarily. Right. So one of the areas, for example, that's that's in this year's report has to do with federal facility management. So how agencies are able to manage their portfolio of, of real property, of, of uh, headquarters, offices, and, and other facilities. And that's been on GAO's high risk list for many years now um, with having vacant and underutilized properties. And so we made recommendations that uh, agencies, especially in the age of now more people working remotely and telework, um, that agencies really need guidance and benchmarks to be able to calculate what kind of facility usage they actually need mm -hmm. um, to be able to save hundreds of millions of dollars potentially. Yeah, that's an indicator too. I imagine that that just the course of events either make some of these these challenges worse, make some of them better sometimes, or maybe in some cases make some of them go away. Is that the, what you've experienced uh, as you've done this work? Yeah, yeah. I, we're pleased to say, that, you know, there has been quite a bit of progress, as I mentioned. You know, we've had a number of our recommendations implemented, uh, but things do change, and we do try to stay in constant communication with the agencies that we audit. And you know, if it seems like they're meeting the spirit of the recommendation, we might still consider that that implemented, even if it wasn't exactly what we recommended. What are some of the recommendations that you've made this year that should be reasonably? Maybe easy is not the right word, but but that agencies should be able to to uh, execute in a, in, a, in a reasonable manner. One of the, the uh, areas that we had in this year's report that I think is a, is a pretty good news story um, is in the, the um, management and coordination around the health risks from wildfire smoke. There are a number of different agencies that are involved um, in uh, dealing with wildfires and other sources of smoke and getting health information out to the public. And actually several of the recommendations that we made in the original report have already been implemented and a lot of progress has been made in making uh, a new um, memorandum of, of agreement among the agencies and clarifying their roles and responsibilities. Uh, w a lot of the work that I've seen over the years in looking at this has been focused not just on the savings or cost avoidance, but also focused on the service delivery to the person that's receiving the service from the federal government. Has the emphasis on customer experience, both toward in the Trump administration, now the Biden administration, has that emphasis made a difference in the results that you've seen over the time that you've been working on these issues, Jessica? I'm not sure if, uh, 
It probably has made a difference. I mean, certainly I think that that has been a focus of a number of the agencies that we work with, that they are trying to understand things, um, not just from a, a process perspective, uh, but also from the, the recipient side and make sure that they understand, you know, what are what are the, the recipients looking for um, and how can they provide a, a better service there and making sure that they're communicating with their, their customer, mm -hmm. if you will, um, about what the results should be. Um, what, are the, what are some of the other highlights of the recommendations that you make in this work this year? We've got several recommendations related to tax issues. That's uh, one that's been there for, you know, for uh, every year pretty much. Um, but this year in particular, looking at um, how IRS is uh, dealing with its audits, um, particularly of those areas that are of a, a high focus for them. So um, high income and high wealth taxpayers, um, large complex partnerships, we recommended that they better um, define what those are um, and that they have a strategy uh, in place for, for improving those. And it's to make sure that they're not burdening taxpayers unnecessarily, um, those who are you know, paying their fair share, um, but instead targeting the, the audits to those who um, are trying to avoid paying taxes. I imagine you do get a lot of follow-up from Capitol Hill after these uh, reports come out every year. You mentioned that uh, some of these uh, re will require congressional uh, 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 intervention to be able to change. Right. So one of the ones that we talk about in uh, several reports has been on the, the first net, the first responder network. Um, and uh, that program, when it sunsets in 2027, um, we said that the that Congress needs to reauthorize it before it sunsets uh, to be able to um, to get the $15 billion in, in fees from that program and also make it more effective um, for first responders, too. Jessica, it's great to talk to you again. Thanks for your time today. Yeah, thank you. Always a pleasure. You can find links to the work that Jessica and her colleagues released on overlap, duplication, and fragmentation on today's show page at FedGovToday.com. FedGov Today continues in a moment. Don't miss the latest episode of Innovation in Government. You'll get exclusive insights from the Artificial Intelligence for Government Summit presented by Kerasoft. Discover how AI's revolutionizing government operations. You'll meet leaders from the Department of Homeland Security, the Labor Department, and the Commerce Department telling you what they're doing now and what's coming next for AI in government. Innovation in Government, on demand now at innovationingov.com. Welcome back in today's event spotlight. U.S. Cyber Command and the Defense Information Systems Agency are the headliners again this year at AFSIA International's TechNet Cyber. It's coming June 25th to 27th at the Baltimore Convention Center. The speaker list already includes the Pentagon CIO John Sherman and the director of DISA, Lieutenant General Robert Skinner. You can read more about TechNet Cyber and register at fedgovtoday.com slash events. FedGov Today TV next Sunday morning at 1030 includes an exit interview with Krista Russia, who just finished his tenure as Federal Chief Information Security Officer and PJ Lechleitner, the head of ICE, returns to the show next week, too. I'm Francis Rose. I'll see you next Sunday. Thanks for watching. Have a great week.